This video is made possible by Practical Defense Systems, the best online security training at the lowest prices. You can start your security career today online at pdsclasses.com. Check them out. Hi, this is Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for all of your support of Gun Guy TV and of me. I really do appreciate it. I've got a great interview planned today with Rick Travis from CRPA. We're going to talk about a whole lot of stuff because right now in California and across the nation, right before the presidential election and after the appointment of Amy Connie Barrett to the Supreme Court, there's a lot to talk about. So let's get to it and let's go talk to Rick. Rick, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. I know this is kind of a busy time for you. It's a busy time for everybody. Uh, so I want to talk about a whole bunch of stuff. Before we do, though, I'm getting a lot of phone calls about the uh, the bit with ARs and AK pistols. Apparently, I haven't checked, but apparently there's a at least one YouTube video out there and uh, some other things in the on the web talking about ATF having issued a ruling regarding uh, the NFA and AR pistols and AK pistols. I don't know the answer. Maybe you do. But before we get to that, I do want to, uh, I'll share a screenshot of a story that came out today in The Truth About Guns that says, and I quote, calm down, the ATF has not ruled that your AR or AK pistol is an NFA regulated item. So if I look at the story itself, I'll just read you a little bit of it, and then I'll put a link in the description. So if you're concerned about that, then you can go there. It says, if you spend time watching YouTube videos and trolling the, the gunosphere, you may have run across some videos and other posts announcing that the ATF now considers braced ARs and AK pistols to be any other weapons and is therefore regulating under the National Firearms Act with all the paperwork and taxes that goes along with it. Here's what you need to know about these claims. According to the article, they are not true. No such ruling or communication from the ATF has been issued. So what I'm going to do since I honestly don't know the answer, uh, and I'm not, you know, I, I gave up trying to be an expert a long time ago. Uh, I, that's why I have people like you on. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't know the answer. So what I will do if you're watching is I'll put a link to that, um, that uh, article in the description. You're welcome to go read it, and you can investigate it yourself. And uh, Rick, obviously, if you know anything about that, uh, let me know. I was not, I'm not really following that, so I don't know. There's nothing yet that has come out, nor do I expect it will. The problem, and I'm glad you're highlighting this, is we have a lot of people who are looking at about five seconds of an hour-long conversation, usually from an attorney who does not specialize on Second Amendment issues, who puts a hypothetical out there and says, oh, this could happen if all these things line up a certain way. And then we have a lot of people that jump on social media and start pushing it around, and it becomes a a thing, but it's not necessarily the truth, as in this case. Yeah, we don't know. What, yeah, it doesn't sound like it is. And I'll put the article up for you one more time. There you go. Uh, there's the article. So you can see it. It's on the truth about guns. There will be a link in the description. Okay. So now that hopefully we've handled that, my phone will stop ringing. <laughs> I've been ringing. I've been getting texts and all kinds of stuff, emails. What's happening? Okay. So anyway, that's the, uh, that's the down and dirty about that. So let's talk, Rick, let's talk about some stuff. Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, just yesterday was sworn in last night. I mean, talk about a whirlwind confirmation. Yeah, Zap, they'd screw around. And no sooner was she confirmed than Trump took her over there to be sworn in by Justice Thomas. And that night, sworn in with the Supreme Court oath in a private ceremony with Chief Justice Roberts. She now is official as a Supreme Court justice. And it's been bandying about right now that we now have a conservative majority on the court. Your thoughts? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I'm thinking. Anyway, go ahead. So one of the things is, for everybody, there are justices that get placed on the Supreme Court that many people think are going to be way, way to the left. They tend to be moderately left. There are people that think justices are going to be way, way to the right, and sometimes they become moderately right, and sometimes over a period of time move even farther over one way or the other. And it also depends on the issue. So, you know, in the case of Justice Barrett, I, like everybody else, am excited. I am happy. I think she's more than qualified to be a justice. But what that necessarily means for the Second Amendment community, we have to wait and see. Oh, she's not going to be a carbon copy of Scalia or a resurrected Scalia. She has a mind of her own. 
Uh, she's somebody that is going to bring, I think, really good jurisprudence. And I like the fact that she's an originalist, which all day to day has been brought up to mean that she's racist and she's this and she's that. No, all originalist means is you go back to the Constitution and you try to put in time the framework of the framers and the different cases since then of where we were as a country and you make your decisions there. And as Justice Scalia said, that sometimes actually handcuffs a justice from what they personally believe to what they can do from the bench. Now, on many occasions, he found that true of himself. So, you know, a lot of what happens in these, especially Second Amendment cases, and it's one of the things I talk about to crowds all the time, is there is no one attorney that is going to take a case from start all the way to the Supreme Court. And that's one of the things that concerns me because. You know, a lot of attorneys look at this as their equivalent to making it to the World Series in baseball. You know, they want to go to the show. But the fact is, to get to the show, you don't go as a rookie and automatically become the MVP pitcher. You need to be part of a bigger team that's working over a longer period of time that has more expertise. So even with Chuck Michelle, who's one of the best Second Amendment attorneys in the country and been honored across the country for that, when we get to the Supreme Court, Chuck's not the one arguing the case. We have people that are our experts who have argued case after case. They anticipate what each of those justices are going to ask and have answers for it. And uh, you only get that through experience. You know, it's amazing. I, I know he said it to you, too, and he said it to me, but Chuck has said many times that he would not argue a Supreme Court case. Right. Because he doesn't feel prepared to do that, which is why he, they hire people who do that, and that's what they do. In fact, he was telling me that, that he was telling me you'd have to you had, kind of have to shut down your whole practice for like six to eight months just to get ready for the oral argument, yeah. because it goes it turns on a dime and it goes all kinds of different places. And uh, but back to back to Judge Barrett, I agree with you. I think it's a, it's exciting. Certainly, yeah. she's not going to be not not it is true she's not going to be she's not a resurrected Scalia. Right. But she's not a resurrected Ginsburg either. And so yeah, yeah. we've certainly moved the, we've moved the needle very solidly in the right direction. But at the same time, I think there's a tendency when something like this happens to go, ah, oh, okay, I can relax now. I don't have to fight the battle anymore. And I'm not sure that that's wise. And I'm wondering what your view is on that. My view is the battle's bigger today than it was yesterday. It has not gotten better. It has gotten more strategic. And we have a bigger fight than we ever have. I mean, one of the things I'd point out is she had barely got in for a confirmation hearing when Senator Blumenthal highlighted a California Rifle and Pistol Association case that we're all familiar with called Duncan v. Becerra, dealing with, you know, can we have uh, what we would call standard capacity magazines? And Blumenthal said, this is the end of the world as we know it because she's going to take Duncan v. Becerra and she's going to rule with what he called an outlier opinion. And that's what he was calling the opinion from who we call St. Benitas down here in our circuit, but saying that, you know, that's such an outlier. It's not there. And this is why we're going to get crazy laws. Looking at that, looking at the um, playground of the courts, what is being looked at by um, Biden and Harris, if they get elected in, what a lot of the Democrats, if they get the majority, want to do to the Supreme Court. This has just got more intense, and this is not the time for the Second Amendment community to go, we're done, we got our majority, because we don't know. There's been several justices throughout time that when you brought on somebody younger, newer, a little bit more conservative, they went and leaned to the other side. So we don't know if we have a majority. And we're not going to know that until we get some of these cases up there and get to see where it goes. These folks are not going to stop fighting for progressive beliefs. These people are not going to stop fighting for anti-gun beliefs. Or am I all wet here, Rick? I mean, I, you know, I think we, we, we've got to keep our nose to the grindstone and keep working. Well, one of the things I think we all have to look at is the Supreme Court is just a part. At the very top, albeit, they have the final say. But there's a couple of things to remember about the Supreme Court. Number one, they don't take all cases. They pick and choose what they're going to take. So you have to look down to the circuit courts and the lower courts. And that is where the battleground is. And people forget something. We, the people, vote at the lowest level of those courts. And then the people we elect, like in the case of Donald Trump, 
has placed several conservative judges here in the Ninth Circuit to bring balance. Let's say, you know, our people don't show up and vote and we get Biden. I guarantee you a Biden-Harris ticket is not going to be placing the same kind of justices on the Ninth Circuit. And that parity that we've just about achieved could go absolutely in the opposite direction, which means the Supreme Court aren't going to get the cases that we want. And you've got to realize we have a lot of people out there that start this process of a what could be a Second Amendment lawsuit that either A, don't know how to frame the case, and so we really don't want to go that much forward because it would actually do more harm than good, or B, don't have the funding to get it past the Ninth Circuit. If that Ninth Circuit is largely liberal, filled with en bancs and, and Democratic judges in the various states covered by the Ninth Circuit, it's never going to make its way out to the Supreme Court. And so this is a choreography for the law on either side that you may be on any subject. So it's not just the Second Amendment that you have to look. It's the courts in the local area. Are they abiding? Because, you know, we had two great landmark cases in Heller and McDonald. And what happened? A lot of people in the more liberal court sections of the country were like, yeah, and we're not going to listen to that. We're going to carve out other exceptions and ideas on scrutiny and other ways to look at cases and water down Heller and McDonald. And because we didn't have a conservative Supreme Court, we have been almost two decades to try to get something back up on paper to say, hey, you, no, you have to follow these rules. So maybe we get that, especially with some of the cases we've been able to advance in this window of Trump changing the configuration of the Ninth Circuit. So we've got Duncan, Rody, and now Rupp, which is on the assault weapons, all moving that direction. Um, so maybe we get that, but at the same token, we lose Trump for a second four-year term, and we don't have a secure Ninth Circuit. That Ninth Circuit can flip in a heart. Well, and here's the other concern I have, not just with, with not reelecting Trump. If we fail to reelect Trump, regardless of what you may think of him personally, if we fail to because I, I don't know the man, so I don't know whether I would like him personally or not. But so far, in my humble opinion, he's done a great job. And the alternative is horrible. So if we fail to elect Trump, that's one problem. Here's another one. We elect Trump, but we fail to keep the Senate in the hands of the Republicans where Mitch McConnell is driving through these justices. And or we fail to flip the House. How does that affect the battle? Yeah, and that's that's the that's the big problem. I mean, people forget that we have, you know, 12 circuits right now. And so any of those circuits can bring any case that can go to the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court hears it and rules on it, that becomes not just land, law of that circuit, it becomes law of the land. And so, you know, in order to make this happen, that's what I was trying to get at, just because we got Amy, Tony Barrett out there as a justice. And let's just say we live in a wonderful land and we do have the majority of those justices. Those justices can only hear cases that make it out of the lower courts. Those lower courts are decided by a Senate that approves whoever the President of the United States has recommended. If that Senate goes Democrat, it doesn't matter who's president because there's not going to be a conservative justice pushed forward. Same thing happens in the lower areas. If you have you know, um, governors, state senates, and different groups, and an electorate that's not paying attention and just looks, oh, that's just a judge, mark whatever, that's what leads. Because remember, any Comey Barrett didn't just graduate law school and become a US Supreme Court justice. She clerked and she was appointed up. And you know some of the other justices had to run for a local position to get into the circuit. So when you look at the qualifications to become a justice in one of the circuit courts or a justice on the Supreme Court, there are many, many factors that play into that. And a lot of it hinges on upon who we, the people, elect in the office. You know, I think it, it's important to us, even if, even if nothing else, pay attention to the Senate, pay attention to the House, pay attention to your state legislature and your, and your state house. Because as Rick said, I mean, the president's not a king. He can, he can nominate a justice, but unless he has a friendly Senate, that goes nowhere. Or he, things, or he has to now nominate a less palatable justice in order to get one to fill a seat because he has to deal with the opposite side 
which he hasn't had to do lately. I mean, Mitch McConnell has been taking these justices at every level and just ramming them through in the face of opposition because he's had the votes to do it. So it's important that we keep that in place. The other thing I want to see, and maybe it's just me, I want to see national right to carry reciprocity. And we're not going to get that if we don't flip the House and we don't keep the Senate. It's not going to happen. The president can't just wave a magic wand or stroke a pen and make that happen. So we've got to keep those in place. You wanted to say something, Rick. I'm sorry. I think I interrupted you. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, one of the things I've been talking to people about, it's called the neighbor effect. And what I mean by that is any of us in our homes or apartments, or whatever, your neighbors have an impact on your life. If your neighbor is doing something great, that's great. If they're doing something extremely negative, that can affect your property values, your way of life, et cetera. The problem is when we go to vote, we tend to look right at our own little community, hopefully, not always. And, but we don't look at the communities around us. So like here in California, we have some big communities, Los Angeles, San Diego, um, you could argue Santa Barbara, San Francisco, definitely Sacramento. And we have sometimes go, oh, well, that's way up there. Well, we have to remember, way up there is what gave us a corrupt, dysfunctional mayor as our governor. Because people didn't say, wait a second, and really come out, we don't want people to do all the things they're doing in San Francisco and how the, the city's falling apart. We don't want that for all of California. We have to start looking at where these people come from, because a lot of times they go, oh, that city council member was an idiot. Well, next thing you know, that city council member is an assemblyman, a state senator, running for Congress, and maybe even Senate one day, um, or president. So, you know, had anybody said, did any of us see Kamala Harris a decade ago being a heartbeat away from the Oval, potentially? Uh, no, but here we are. Well, and I didn't write that down, but I'm going to do it right now. In fact, I'm not, because I'm just going to ask the question now. I've got some other things I want to talk about as well. But Californians, we know Kamala, Kamala, however she says her name, Harris. Yeah. Uh, she, she seems to change it every once in a while, or she's picky yeah. about it anyway. But we know her very well because we had her as our attorney general, and she's a wreck. Mm -hmm. But I'm not so sure the other 49 states know her all that well. What, what, can we, can we share, what, what can you share about how Kamala, Kamala, <laughs> whatever, uh, Harris, what, how did she affect our Second Amendment rights in the state of California? And what do you think she might be doing nationally if she becomes president? Because I'm going to tell you right now, Slow Joe, uh, you know, she's she's one heartbeat away from the presidency if they elect him. And it's Joe's heartbeat. Does that tell you anything? So <laughs> just be quiet where that's concerned. And you go ahead, Rick. I think there's a couple of things that are not happening that should be happening. For one thing, our community nationwide isn't listening to us in California. We have very clearly put out several documents, proof showing that, you know, she most likely filled out her 4473 illegally because she has admitted multiple times during this campaign, both the primaries and during the campaign, that she smoked marijuana at a same time period that she filled out her 4473, which uh, as we Rick, know, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. People don't know what a 4473 is. So can you explain that? that you fill out for your dross with the federal okay. government. And there is a line on there that asks you if you smoke marijuana. And if you answer yes, you are disqualified from purchasing a firearm. To lie on that form is a felony. And I'm going to leave it at that because you can't have it both ways. You can't say, yeah, I've been smoking marijuana and put on your 4473 no, because that's a lie and that's a felony. But of course, we have a governor that didn't want to do anything about it. And we have a national media that doesn't want to talk about it. And unfortunately, we have a lot of different groups, 2A groups across the country are like, eh, I don't want to see as like beating up on somebody. Well, here's the problem. This lady has no problems living a life that what she does is okay for her, but not for you. Which means she can have her firearm, she can do things her way, but she wants to restrict you. And she wants to take your guns away. And that's just a fact. That's not hyperbole. That's not fear mongering. That's, that's a proven record with her. Well, I think, I think, you know, there's an old saying, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Mm -hmm. So from, a, from the perspective of a Californian, I'm just going to tell you if you're watching this about Kamala Harris. First of all, Kamala Harris is incredibly anti-2A. 
Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, that may be the understatement of the century. Here's the other thing about Kamala Harris. She is what they call a transactional politician. And what I mean by that is that she's going to say and do whatever she needs to say and do in order to promote the career of Kamala Harris. She doesn't, there's no morals there. And I don't say that because I'm attacking her personally. I say that because we've seen it in California. We understand who she is. She is an amoral politician, at least from the standpoint of her career. She does what she needs to do and says what she needs to say in order to progress. She has no convictions. She has no platform. She's all over the place. It's whatever makes her successful. Now, along the way, it's about her success, not yours. It's not about representing you. It's about improving the life of Kamala Harris. And so Rick is exactly right. She's perfectly happy with making sure she retains the ability to do things while taking away your ability to do it. And that's right. been our experience in the state of California. So if you're looking at Kamala and you're saying, well, she, you know, she looks, she didn't look that bad. And if Joe kicks off, well, Kamala will be great. Uh, well, if you want a transactional president who will say and do whatever she wants to say and do, or whatever she needs to say and do to progress in her own life at the, at the risk of yours, then yeah, she'd be a great person as president. If you'd like somebody who's going to actually look after the United States and your welfare, you might want to pick somebody else. All right, on to other things now that I've ranted about that. Pardon me, but uh, you know, at some point or other, people should at least listen to us. We've had to suffer under the pain of this woman before. I'm curious in your mind, with uh, back to Amy Connie Barrett briefly, uh -huh. regardless that we don't really know how she will rule on Second Amendment things, I think we kind of have an indication that it will be better perhaps, or significantly better than what uh, Ruth Buzzy Ginsburg would have done. Um, how does that, how does the fact that she's now on the court play into the political game when it comes to attorneys general like Becerra deciding whether to take a case to a certain point and actually risk it going to the Supreme Court? Does that play into their mindset and their decision making? And if so, how? Yeah, how it will play in, and we got to see how she rules. It, it probably won't play a whole lot until after the first ruling. So let's just say, hypothetically, Duncan V. Becerra goes for, forward and the Supreme Court sides with the California Rifle Pistol Association on that. And as a result, standard capacity magazines are available. No longer do we have to suffer under the spare tire mini 10 round magazine. We get to have actual magazines. Once that, that kind of a ruling would come down, what would happen is, even at the lower courts, um, depending on how a case is tried, whether it goes through a local superior court or goes through the federal system, what would happen is each of those prosecuting attorneys on the other side, the government's side, would have to wait, do I want this just to affect the county level? Do I want this to affect just the state level? Do I want this to affect a regional level such as the Ninth Circuit, or do I want this to become national? Realizing that most attorney generals have aspirations of climbing the political ladder, they also have to look at funding. So if they were to push a case and lose, and that was to become the law of land bigger than it was originally intended for, then that also becomes problematic when it comes to fundraising for their future campaign. So yes, there's definitely a political part of that equation that those different uh, attorney generals who are also politicians are going to have to look at. Well, all attorneys general are politicians. I mean, it's a political, it's a political office. They run for office. Or just district like, attorneys. You know. Just like a sheriff or a district attorney. Right. And so I was curious. I, I, so, again, we kind of have to wait to see how Justice Barrett rules and what her opinions are in the first case that hits her desk. Now, we have, uh, before I go on to some other questions, we have a number of cases that are working their way up through the court in California that if they were to actually end up at the Ninth Circuit, a couple of them are already there, and we win at the Ninth Circuit, then that doesn't just affect California, does it? No, that affects all the states covered by the Ninth Circuit and the territories. And, how, and I don't know how many states that is, and I lose track of it, but it's a lot. I mean, it's... It's, it's obviously, it's Hawaii... Um, it's, you know, most of the, what you call the Western U S yeah. If you're in the Pacific Southwest, for example, the Ninth circuit covers you for the most part. And most of the Pacific Northwest, doesn't it? 
as well as Hawaii. Does Alaska in there? I don't remember. I think it is. I can look it up real quick while we're talking. Okay, well, that's fine. It's not necessary. But I mean, my point is, and you can look it up if you're watching. You can just look it up and, and uh, search it on the internet. But it, the, the important thing is that if you're outside of California, support CRPA because these cases are going to affect you too, because most of them are going to end up at the Ninth Circuit. We have. It does, it does impact Alaska. It's Arizona, Nevada, Idaho, Montana, Washington, Oregon. California, Alaska, Hawaii, and like Guam and the Marianas. Yeah. So if you're any in any of those places, yep. the Ninth Circuit covers a pretty large piece of the United States. And so what happens there with the nutty ninth, which is not quite so nutty anymore, by the way, yeah. entirely because of Donald John Trump. But mm -hmm. uh, there you are. So let's hope that if he stays in office, he'll keep appointing justices there and we'll have a majority instead of kind of a 50-50 split, which is about what we got now. We have a lot of, well, speaking of Trump, even before I answer that, have you, is it just me or have you noticed an unusual amount of Trump support in California? I mean, they had him up in your area, up in Orange County, but, and, but Orange County is traditionally conservative, but I've seen rallies now in, uh, in Hollywood, in uh, Beverly Hills. And I mean, come on, they're happening all over the place. Um, is it, are you seeing these or am I just catching outlier things going on? No, there, there's definitely been a shift, but I, I want to point out some having grown up a good chunk of my life in Orange County. Uh, we have definitely not the conservative county. That's more legend than reality. Uh, we have a much greater Democratic influence. We have a lot of money being pumped in by the DNC, even in the local city council races here in Orange County. So um, I don't want anybody thinking that this county's got together because we're fighting like every other county. But yes, we have seen groups. Um, who have changed course, at least when it's come out on the Second Amendment. And I think a lot of that's had to do with uh, COVID, all the things around COVID that have caused people to wake up and realize, oh, my pantry doesn't have the name Vons, Albertsons, or Costco on it, or Walmart. And they've learned that, uh, wait a second, there isn't enough law enforcement, fire, hospital beds for me, and I could have to take care of myself for a period of time. And I think that coupled with all the fires and all, all the other mayhem that has been 2020 has been what's been funneling all these new 1.3 million um, estimated firearm owners in California. And that has created a groundswell movement across where a lot of people that traditionally didn't question their personal security and safety are now questioning it. And as a result, that is becoming a voting topic. And I think it's very interesting when you look at the national news media and the Democrats, they're not pushing their anti-gun agenda. In fact, they've been pretty silent the last two months on it, with the exception of Blumenthal yesterday on the Amy Coney Barrett you know, testimony. That was the only blip on the radar screen we'd seen for a while. And I think there, there's a reason for that. They're afraid to come out and say, I'm against the Second Amendment because of the backlash of the vote, because there's that moderate chunk right now that that's a huge issue for them. And they don't want to lose the firearms they just went and purchased to protect their family. You know, I've seen a number of articles, Rick. Uh, some are extraordinarily optimistic about the new gun owners and purporting that the gun owners are now going to shift the, the conversation in favor of the Second Amendment in the way that they vote. I've read others that say, no, people are buying guns, but they're still voting uh, for Biden, for example, or they're still right. voting for progressive candidates. I, I don't know if there's polls out there or whatever that point one way or the other, but I think one bellwether of it might be membership in 2A organizations. Are you seeing an increase in membership at CRPA? We're, we're seeing some. I mean, it's definitely an uptick. I mean, you can also look across in the, the hunting world. We've seen an uptick in hunters for the first time in a couple of decades. So, yeah, there's an uptick. Is it significant enough to move the ball? And here's where it comes down to. Just because you belong to the NRA, GOC, us, and the other organization does not mean you vote. And no, it doesn't mean you vote favorably either. Right. <laughs> right. Lies the rub. We, a, we don't know if they're voting. B, we don't know who they're voting for. Um, generally, I don't trust polls because a lot of people say things that are just the opposite. I mean... I had a family member that voted very conservatively, but if you asked him who he was voting for, he always said the other person, hmm. just because he didn't want you to know who he was voting for. 
So that was, you know, I don't always trust the polls. And I think the last election um, where Trump got in, we saw the polls were in completely wrong. So well, well, I'm not, I won't be surprised if that's the case now because they keep showing uh, Biden ahead. I mean, it's always possible, I suppose, but I still can't figure out other than the fact that he's got the media on his side. I can't figure out how you win a, a an election from your basement. But it, you know, I'll tell you, this has been a weird year, so I'm not yeah. taking that for granted, because if you'd ask me that half the things that happened this year would all happen in one year, I wouldn't have believed it. Uh, yep. in, in my lifetime. So weirdest year I've ever been in. So I don't think we can take for granted mm -hmm. that Biden's going to lose because he's got some uh, mental decline and because he's hiding in his basement. I think we got to get out there and we got to cast our vote. Well, What's listen, surprising to me on that, Joel, is we come from a community of people that love to competitively shoot or compare their hunting stories or whatever. You never hear the person come from a competition and say, oh, I got into the quarterfinals and then I just collected my trophy. Or, oh, hey, I saw the deer, and I just bought home. You have to finish the competition. And the thing that concerns me is there's a lot of people listening to media that they claim they don't trust and only making their decision of where we're at in the process. This is not over until that last ballot has been cast and counted. Well, and that may not happen on Election Day in some places, oh, because there are going. some places that are ballast harvesting and uh, California. Yeah. And there are some places that are uh, are extending the counting of the ballots until for so many days, as long as they are post dated on the date of the election or before. So we're not really. I mean, if it's close, if it's a landslide one way or the other, it's a landslide one or one or the other. But I, I won't be surprised if this ends up in court. And speaking of court, <laughs> we have cases going on here in California. Can you give us an update on any of those? Sure. So right now we have first the one we've mentioned already, Duncan v. Becerra. So we're waiting to see where that's going. There's continual filings that are happening within the Ninth Circuit dealing off will we have or will we not have an en banc. I think that ball's being kicked effectively post-election because, again, the politics of what you talked about earlier is in play. The same is Trudy, as Trudy, wow, true of the Rody v. Becerra case which deals with the ammunition in Prop 63. And then we also have the Rupp v. Becerra case that's made its way into the Ninth Circuit and is progressing through there that goes against the assault weapons um, amalgamation of everything that has been done with it. And then finally, we are starting a case that is going after the uh, roster here in California. So all those cases are at different levels. Nothing's really progressed as far as we're going to get any hearing or anything until after the election. So, you know, unfortunately, everybody's waiting to see what the outcome is. Well, and that, yeah, I get it. I understand. Okay, so now I, I want to, this is the point at which, if you're watching this, <laughs> that Joel is going to speak about something nobody ever wants to talk about. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to have anything to do with it. And it's called money. <laughs> And so I'm going to ask Rick the golden question here. How much does it cost to actually have these cases, to prosecute these cases, to take them and, and have these lawsuits and carry them? You mentioned earlier that some people just don't have the money to get it to the Ninth Circuit, let alone past it. What's the cost of these things? We talk about this all the time when I go out to fundraise because that's part of my job for these cases. And, and one of the interesting things is, Unfortunately, all of us tend to think about, um, you know, what a small claims case or a traffic accident when your car, you know, and you end up in court. For some people, unfortunately, when there's a divorce or a dissolution of a business partnership, those are kind of the pretty much the pretty biggest cases that most of us will ever face on lifetime. And so we take those figures of what those costs and think, oh, well, that's what this costs. So actually, just to get, as Chuck would tell you, um, all the paperwork and everything set up and all the expert testimony and things to get through either a federal or a local case, you're usually looking at about 150 to 200K to that point to do it the right way. Then if it goes on up to the Ninth Circuit, you're probably another 250 to sometimes a half a million dollars depending on the case, how broad it is, the timing, there's a lot of factors that come into it. 
And wait, realize, wait, 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 hold on. You just, uh, and I, I sounded like Biden there for a minute. Wait, 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 wait. So sorry about that. I'm doing my Biden impression. Come on, man. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me make sure I understood that. A hundred to 150 K to get it. That's a hundred to $150,000. Right. To get it to a certain level and then an additional 200 to $250,000 to get it beyond that? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to make sure I heard that right. No. And at the time you get to the Supreme Court, it's like you said, you know, even these attorneys who are experts and who literally do things at a very discounted rate compared to what you see in other um, lawsuits. I tell people all the time look at lawsuits where people are defending themselves from attacks from the IRS who are like CEOs of nonprofits or big corporations. Um, a lot of those are like $2 million a month in fees. And so that's why I look at people all the time and go, when these Second Amendment attorneys who are among the best, who are honored by the bar associations in various states and nationally for being the best in this particular focused area of the Second Amendment, and the entire case is less than half a month of one of these other national cases to defend a Mark Zuckerberg or somebody else, realize just how much they're doing this because it's a passion of love. The time you pay for just the paperwork, I was looking in one of the cases, just the copying was over 40K for all the paperwork and briefs and stuff that had to be done. Yeah, you're not going to Kinko's for that. You have to go to a, don't you have to go to a special printer right. because they have yeah. to print it in a specific format. Correct. And so there's that, there's not that many printers that do that. So these printers that do that, that's what they specialize in and their fees are, I, you know, Chuck was telling me that at SHOT Show. Yeah. And I was stunned at the cost of just printing the things that they well, needed to print. It has to be secured. I mean, it has to be so things can't filter out to the media and other places because it's supposed to be clean when it goes before those judges and the other people that are involved in it. And then it's the expert witnesses. It's getting those people to where they got to go. So that's why this, you know, these bills run up very, very fast. And that's why, you know, some people will prosecute a case to the to the point that they can afford to and then they bail out well depending on where they bail out if they didn't get the decision and didn't appeal that decision that decision now becomes a bad precedent for future cases and so that's one of the reasons that constantly i'm saying you know you got to pick and choose which team you want pushing out which team has the breadth and depth of experience knows what they're doing and knows the right way i mean obviously the roster has been around for a while why did we wait to this point? We were waiting for decisions to click in that now it makes sense to push the roster issue. Now it makes sense to go after that. And we have the people and the expertise lined up to have the best chance possible of winning. Well, this is something that I think um, we get bagged on. I say we, metaphorically. The Second Amendment community is certainly CRPA and other organizations get bagged on a lot because they think strategically about these cases. They don't get every case because some of them are not going to work out that well. There is strategy and then there's tactics. The tactics being, let's take this case and let's go, let's go file a lawsuit and we're going to work through that and get there. But the strategy is which one do we pick and how far do we think we can get that and how much money do we have and how many other groups can we get into a, to, to be involved. People are enamored because of Hollywood and books with Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Mm -hmm. Great book. I've read it. I've studied it. Sun Tzu, in one of the chapters of his book, said that strategy is the longest road to victory. Strategy without right. tactics. Strategy by itself without tactics is the longest road to victory. Tactics without strategy is just a noise before defeat. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful. I mean, this guy wrote that a long time ago. He understood that without some strategy, if all we do is go after things tactically, all we're doing is making a lot of noise and we're hurting ourselves. So that's why these cases have to be chosen strategically and because there is a goal in mind. It's, it's, a, it's a very complex game that we're playing. If, it's not really a game, but if you think about it that way, it's very complex. And so it takes experts to choose these cases wisely and know that they can prosecute them all the way through if they possibly can. So now the big question is, where do, where do, how can I help? How do we help you have more money to do this? Well, I would oh. like to go back. Oh, absolutely. Go right ahead. Yeah, you bet. So one of the issues I think a lot of people have to realize when it comes to strategy and gain a case to the Supreme Court is you need a conflict within the lower circuit courts. In other words, you need this circuit to say, oh, you can only do X. You can't do Y. 
in this circuit on this side to say you can do Y and not X. Now the Supreme Court feels compelled to actually hear that case because there's a conflict that makes it imbalanced for Americans. Hmm. But if all the circuits are saying, oh, we don't think anybody, should, for example, should be able to carry concealed, there's not really a need for the night for the Supreme Court to jump on that. But if half are saying no concealed, only open, the other half are saying only open, no concealed, and some are saying nothing at all. Now we have a national conflict. Now there's a reason for the Supreme Court to elevate that case up and make a decision becomes law of the land. So isn't that really that, isn't that really their major function is to settle right. conflicts among the lower courts? Correct. And so that's where it sometimes comes down to to trying to find, is there another Second Amendment group that's arguing something else that helps with that conflict so we can get a decision and get a definitive answer of what's right for all of us? Will they sometimes, will the Supreme Court sometimes wait to take a case to see how that bubbles up? Yep. So in other words, if there's a conflict going on, but there's another case that might actually contribute to that conflict in one way or the other, they'll wait for that one to be decided before they'll take that to decide it. Correct. Very interesting. That's why they only take, what do they take? 50, 60 cases a year. Yeah. And that's why just because we get, like we did this last year, almost a dozen cases up there, and then they didn't want to hear any of them. They're looking at a couple of things, not just that, but also a strategy of, do we have enough justices that would most likely side this way? And if we don't, then they don't want to hear it because it's better that <coughs> it stays me. down at a local regional area of a district court that becomes law of the land. Well, it's interesting, too. And no, I don't have COVID. I just coughed into my hand. I'm also in my studio. Well, there's nobody here. So I'll just give it to myself. Um, it, it's interesting that you just said you like we, we had a dozen cases up there and you multiply that dozen by the costs you were just sharing. Mm -hmm. Who pays for all of that? The people have to pay for it. And that's that's why I tell people. First, if you don't like donating money to Second Amendment groups that are prosecuting lawsuits, then vote. Because one of the biggest things, even during this election that I've already seen being out at some of the different gun stores, is there's people from our community that are griping. You know, I don't like this, I don't like that, da, da, da. And people at the counters, as well as myself, constantly ask, and I will tell you right now, nine out of 10 people griping at the counters when I say, did you vote? No. Did you vote in the last election? No. Then why are you griping? Because you're getting exactly what you voted for. Well, I think that people have to understand that if they don't vote for one thing, they're in a sense they're voting for the other because they're just yeah. adding more power to the vote to the the vote that's contrary to their own. If my neighbor votes for let's use Biden and Trump, if my neighbor votes for Trump for Biden and I vote for Trump, all I've done. Now, now I've at least canceled him out. <laughs> He's canceled me out. But if I don't vote, then I've just, he might as well have had two votes instead of one. Correct. So it, it's important that we vote. And I, th I understand why Californians sometimes don't want to vote on this stuff because they feel like their vote is useless or pointless or they never win. Well, I got to tell you, I've felt that way. I really have. But nevertheless, you can't win if you don't play. You can't well, win. You know, people have asked me, what would I do if I win the lottery? I said, I don't know. It would be a miracle. I don't buy a ticket. Well, there's two things that are interesting. And this goes back to Prop 63. And it used to be part of my speech when I was talking to people. I would say, would you vote to go in and save 500 people that were locked in a community that was really negative? And people would be like, well, yeah, sure. I would never leave 500 people there. How about 5,000? Well, definitely if I go for 500, I go for 5,000. There were over 40,000 people in downtown San Francisco that vote against Prop 63. Yet I heard from most of the people in the community, so, well, wait, 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 stop. If you would go save these smaller numbers, why wouldn't you fight for those people? Now, save if you're not from California, by the way, prop, explain Proposition 63, because if somebody's in Idaho, they don't know. <laughs> Prop 63 was the answer. We ended up with a, a political match between two houses. One ran by, at that time, Senator Kevin DeLeon and Governor Brown versus the lieutenant governor, who's now our governor, Gavin Newsom. And the idea was gun McGinnon, as it's been called, was a series of laws that were passed through what's called a gun and men 
process that was done completely not for what it was intended to, but designed to remove many, many parts of the Second Amendment from the average law-abiding gun owner in order to stop Prop 63, which was called the Safety for All Act, that had things like the magazine ban, the ammo ban, and other um, things involved in it from Governor Newsom, who at that time was a lieutenant governor. So Kevin DeLeon wanted to be governor. Brown was back in DeLeon as the former governor. And so that match, we got caught as the piggy in the middle. And so we've had to sue on both of those issues over and over. And we've had to spend literally well over a million dollars in that so far. One of the reasons I wanted you to explain that is because it gets into what we're talking about before was strategy. The New York Rifle and Pistol Association case that New York went and changed the law on. Right. So that the Supreme Court would just go, well, it's moot. We won't rule on it. And that's exactly what happened. They pulled that shenanigan, New York did, because they didn't want the Supreme Court to rule because they felt that the Supreme Court would rule against them. So what they did is they went and undid the law. Well, in the case of Proposition 63 and all of those things, the ammo restrictions, the magazine restrictions, all that stuff, that that wasn't passed by the legislature. That was passed by a vote of the California citizens. And so the legislature, my understanding is, cannot go back and no. by fiat, by, leg- by legislative action, they can't undo that law. They can't take it back. And if they can't take it back, that's a great, co- that's a great case for us to take if we can get it there all the way to the Supreme Court because they can't pull that shenanigan to try to escape the, vic- escape the decision. That's right. one of the reasons these things are being so heavily pursued. And, and I, that's my understanding, Rick, and I, I, you sound like you're confirming that, but my understanding is this, again, it was one of the strategic por- portions of why these cases are being prosecuted, and that's what people have to understand. People who know what they're doing, attorneys who, who specialize in the Second Amendment, are the ones that we've got to listen to when it comes to which of these cases they decide to pursue, because that's what they're thinking through is, what's the chances of winning? And how does this case help us win the next case and the next case and the next case after that? That gets into the strategy and why so often I hear it about NRA, I hear it about GOA, I hear it about every organization. Why didn't they prosecute? Why didn't they sue on this? Why didn't they sue on that? Well, sometimes it's a money issue and sometimes it wouldn't have been a good strategy to do so. So they'll wait until they've got a better case. Exactly. So there you are. All right. Now, how can we help CRPA? You're funding some of these, aren't you? Yes, we are. Duncan, Duncan v. Becerra, Rody v. Becerra, and Rutt v. Becerra are all cases that are being funded by the California Rifle Pistol Association. Which ones of these are at the Ninth Circuit at the moment? All three. Which means there's a chance that any one of those three or all three could be all the way up to the Supreme Court. Which I think that's why I started off today. When Senator Blumenthal used Duncan v. Becerra yesterday in trying to defeat Amy Coney Barrett as a reason you would want to stop it. That shows you how far the left is afraid of that one case alone. So if you're in a state that is uh, that falls under the Ninth Circuit, you might want to pitch in and help out CRPA. If yeah. you're in any state in the union and you're concerned about California laws coming to a zip code near you, you might want to support CRPA because these are the cases that could very easily change the landscape of the Second Amendment jurisprudence, which I'm having trouble saying, the Second Amendment legal landscape under the Ninth Circuit, and possibly the Second Amendment landscape nationally. It's extremely important that we we support CRPA, so I urge you to do that. I'm going to put a link in the description where you can join, but membership is not enough. If you can afford to pitch in a little money, please do. And no, Rick's not paying me to tell you this. <laughs> my desire to save the, the country and the Second Amendment and our constitutional rights is my motivator here. I don't get paid by Rick, and I don't make my money on YouTube. So it, this is not the money is not important to me. What's important to me is getting the money to these organizations so they can get this job done, because I can't. I'm not an attorney, and I don't work for CRPA or any other organization. I'm just here to try to get the word out for you. So I urge you, please do support them. What else can we do beyond that? If I don't have any money, how can I help? Beyond the money, um, if you're in California, get involved with one of our our chapters. We have chapters throughout the state, and those chapters will help you be on the front lines as an activist 
A lot of people are like, well, I don't want to be out there on a street corner. We're not asking you to be on a street corner. We're asking you to be an activist with your family, your friends, your coworkers, people in your neighborhood. Because here's one of the things we haven't talked about that is a, a really huge concern. For any of us in here in California that have had firearms for a while, been exercising our Second Amendment rights, going to the pistol ranges, doing things, it was already crowded. Now we have over a million new friends that need to go to the range. They need to get training. They're brand new gun owners. And we don't have enough of anything. I just spent this last weekend um, as a train counselor bringing in over 20 new instructors with another friend, uh, trying to get more instructors out there because we simply don't have enough instructors to handle the influx of new people. And this is our opportunity to be able to talk with them. But this isn't just California. This is a nationwide phenomenon. We have sold more firearms to more first-time gun owners in the past few months than we normally do in several years combined. And this is a time for us not to get disgruntled and say, oh, I don't have all the time and access that I normally would, which albeit was limited, but this is a time for us to go out and meet these people, welcome them to the, the Second Amendment family, welcome them to, you know, how we think, why we view things. Um, many of them, as you said earlier, Joel, um, may not vote Republican or you know, for the Second Amendment, maybe more progressive voters. But what's interesting is when you sit down and you have an open dialogue about their concerns, why they bought a firearm, talk to them, say, hey, did you know these things were going on? It's amazing. I had a really great conversation with some people during the break, during the training, who were there with their, their spouses who were trying to get trained. And a couple of the people said, hey, you know, I don't understand why you guys get so sensitive on a couple of issues. And one of those issues that we just talked about in California was the fact that we've had people routinely try to say, oh, you know, that new gun you just bought to protect yourself, it's in your name. Yeah. If you die or get a divorce, it's in both your names. But if your spouse was to use it and they got their way, they would be fine. You would go to jail. What? And then when I explained all that to them, they said, oh, now all of a sudden this makes so much more sense. I, I, I can't vote for that person anymore. That wasn't me yelling. That wasn't me telling them they were wrong. In fact, none of those things ever happened. It was me explaining to them. And we've got to remember that the, while these people have just purchased guns, they don't have the, you know, four, five, 10, 20, 30 years of experience that many of you do. And so try to remember what it was like when you first came into this and and just be gentle but be firm and help them understand what's going on one of the things i had to learn early as an instructor because i've been shooting since i was five and i've been carrying a gun for 40 years is that just because it's in my head doesn't mean it's in their head just because i know it doesn't mean they do and it's always it's better to assume that they don't know and oh. go from there uh, it's one of my son is in the habit of he's heard me say this for years. So when I go do something new, in fact, you and I were talking about hunting and I told you certain kinds of game I've never hunted and you had. And I said, I'd love to go with you, brother, but just assume that I know absolutely nothing and you're probably safe. You know, if you go with it into it with that attitude and you understand the other person probably doesn't know and it's OK for them not to know because there was a time when you didn't and you you simply are there to impart the information. You get a lot further. That's for sure. Rick, is there anything that we haven't talked about that we should? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to make a pitch. Uh, one of the things is, obviously, we've all been locked up here in California, at least, during COVID. And, uh, you know, I like to get people out. Um, a lot of the fundraising that I do is not, you know, great and attractive for me to do because it is paying for lawsuits. Um, so one of the ways I keep myself motivated is when I'm able to do things that benefit youth and their families. And so we have two pheasant hunt fundraisers, one that's being held in Lone Pine on the 9th of January, the other one on the 16th of January up in Sacramento area in a place called Dunnigan. Um, you can go to the website, crpa.org, and sign up. But the proceeds from those two pheasant hunts go to fund what we call our next generation programs, which are youth and family opportunities and experiences designed to get them out shooting and work. And we do a whole host of things like that. And then the other thing I will highlight is uh, we are gonna be pushing yet again in the next season um, for a piece of legislation designed to help 
kids who are terminally ill with diseases and their families be able to go into the great outdoors regardless of the season that it's in and be able to experience that. It has been heartbreaking for me over the past year working on trying to get this bill across the line. Um, and COVID didn't help a whole lot because we couldn't get the, the moms and, and the dads and the kids in to testify for it. Um, but one of the things that was really striking to me, Joel, was the number of youth that literally request I was dumbfounded because, you know, being California, being the uh, political landscape that we've had, I just didn't foresee there being a whole lot of kids with a terminal illness going, I want to go hunting, I want to shoot a gun, you know, a little bit more fishing, but not necessarily those things. And uh, went to a couple of the regional children's hospitals, um, learned quite a few lessons very quickly, and this is coming from a, a career paramedic prior to this job. Uh, I never knew that all the, sorry, that all the different um, beads that are around a lot of these kids that kind of look like Mardi Gras, they're little pummy beads. Those are for every time that child has had their body violated for the treatment of that disease. And so I immediately got choked up when I learned all that. So we held at a range here in uh, the Inland Empire, we held uh, at a range, a very private event. We brought out what we thought were gonna be 20 kids and ended up being 60, um, which blew me away with their families and stuff. And uh, I'll share quickly two, two incidences in that. One was we had a, a gentleman come up with his, his young kid and he said, you know, at the age of 12, my plan was to take my son out to the range, teach him how to shoot, and then take him hunting, because that's what my dad did with me. And he goes, my son will never see his 12th birthday. He's 11. And I was like, wow, the kid's in a wheelchair, and the kid's like, can you teach me how to shoot? And so we took him over to the range. All of us instructors who are, are veterans and stuff were choked up. I'm not going to deny that. We got the kid to shoot. The dad shot with the kid, and that was a magical moment. And he called us three weeks later to tell us his son had passed and to thank us for that opportunity. I bring that up because this is what we saw over and over, and it's overwhelming. In California, we lose about 400 kids a quarter that their dying wish in that last year was to shoot a gun or to go hunting or fishing. And because of the way our laws are constructed, they're not able to do that. So we are pushing to get this law across that makes an exception for those individuals because we just feel that they should be able to have it. And there's ways to do it without harming wildlife or anybody else, but to allow them to have that wish. There used to be an organization, it was very small, and um, some friends of mine were seriously involved upon, in it. It was called Wish Upon a Star. And at the time, this has been decades ago, I was very involved in that with them. And the idea was to have these children who were terminally ill get their wish, and we funded it, and we made sure that they got it. And that became Make-A-Wish. Right. And uh, when it became Make-A-Wish, it kind of took off on its own. It became national and so on, and, and uh, I wasn't as involved in it at that point. But when it was Wish Upon a Star, it was a very local thing. Sorry, I have kids. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's a magical thing to help these kids. So I apologize. I uh, I urge you to help. See, I was having a hard time when I was telling this. So. <laughs> I understand, brother. I really do. Uh, it's just tough stuff. But these kids, um, they're it's it's a um, it's an indescribably amazing thing yep. to make these kids' wishes come true. So. I do urge you to support CRPA in this if you can. If you can show up for the event and do a little pheasant hunting or whatever, or whatever the fundraiser is, I urge you to do that as well. And um, anyway, is there anything else we should be talking about? Yeah, that, that pretty much now that it. I've regained my, <laughs> what little composure I ever have, uh, I really appreciate your time, Rick. Thank you very much for coming Thank on the you. show again. Always right. a pleasure. Have a great week and stay safe, okay? You too. All righty. I got to admit that uh, <laughs> uh, that got me. But uh, thank you very much for watching. If you watch this long, you're really a Second Amendment supporter. I'm very grateful 
for your support. And I do urge you to, ur I do urge you, I can speak. I really can. I do urge you to, uh, to support CRPA. Thank you very much for all the support you give me here at uh, gun guy TV. I'm very grateful. Please don't stop. And if you wouldn't mind, share the videos with other friends. I'm trying to get the channel to grow. As I've said many times, I don't make a living on YouTube. That's not what it's about. Um, we do try to keep it funded so that I can keep doing it, but I make my living elsewhere. So the idea here is to use this channel to encourage people to get involved in shooting in the shooting sports and to get information out whenever we can. So any support you can give us, uh, even if that's just sharing the videos, I would deeply appreciate. Have a great week and make sure that you vote, 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 please. Uh, vote early. You haven't got a lot of time to do that or go vote on election day, but make sure that you get out there and vote to save our country and our second amendment. Have a great week. Thank you again and be safe.